maybe I'm thinking this guy that lived up by Eli, kind of across the street, a little bit into the next neighborhood. I think that their family had moved from Montreal, or at the very least, uh, they had some connection to the city. Uh, they had visited, perhaps, the... Uh, there was some kind of like nightclub 2000 t-shirt. I remember that kid had a, a, a hole in his toe. And he told us about that at the, uh, at the morning at the school, you know, before you... Uh, reach. You can't let uh, small four-legged animals eat plastic. Should definitely let them pee on the grass, you know. It's sort of a neighborhood uh, conceit. No one minds if you pee on the grass. If you're a dog. That's kind of the way it is in a neighborhood. Yeah, these kids up by Eli, I just can't remember their name at the moment. In my brain, I'm combining them with a, uh, another set of brothers. And it's one of those things that I've referenced these memories recently. Like, the last years, you know, many times. All of these. These, these, are, these are memories that, uh, my God, that's a... Uh, that's a giant, uh, that's a giant poop. Did somebody come riding a horse through here? What the hell? Come on, Reese. Maybe their dog was gone. And that only, you know, got them gone. They say runners deal with that. And, uh, and learn to kind of like poop on the go. Which is really disturbing. To think, you know, every time you see a jogger, well, hell, that's a lot of poop, but uh, I suppose it's only the really hardcore runners. This is, I'd be suspicious if you've got anybody in your family that runs like uh, marathons, you know, or equivalent, because that's too far, you know, that's too far to run for like, if they're really into it, this might be happening, so. You know, it's kind of on your own conscience there. You uh, you know it exists. You don't want to admit it. I hope not. I hope that's not the case. But uh, he came to uh, the bus stop. Yeah, that and he and he was. This was in Woodhill Crest, right up uh, by Cottage Hill Road. And he came up there, and uh, he had this big bandage on his toe. And by God, from memory, it seems like he pulled a damn cork out of the thing. And there was a literal, uh, cylindrically, perfectly drilled hole into the bone. And uh, he had this little vial that the doctor let him keep. And it was like a size of a Kodak 35 millimeter film canister. Anybody's 35 millimeter standard film canister. Excepting that for the fact that it was transparent and it had this purple liquid in it. And this purple liquid had come out of his toe. I don't know what kind of an infection that is, but I, you know, it's kind of like uh, one of those things is the first time I'd ever heard about it. And what was I, 12 or something? So, I'm kind of thinking, well, damn, you know, this, is, this might be the kind of thing that happens. And uh, I haven't met anybody else or heard anybody else. So, this guy, you know, maybe he made this whole thing up. Maybe it was food coloring. Maybe he got his brother to drill, you know, that sl cylinder into his toe, down to his toe bone. That could have been pranking us.
I remember something about that. Uh, he was talking about the coolest nightclub ever, and it had all these lights. And uh, he and they didn't go to it. This is the sad part, man. This is this is these two kids enthusiastically retelling uh, their parents' adventure, you know, at this discotheque. No. Apparently, it lit the parents up. You know what I mean? They came back and they were just uh, talking, talking, talking about how you know, incredible this disco was. and uh, These guys just stayed up. You know, just, uh, they, were in, they were thrilled. I mean, they'd had a good night themselves. You know, they'd been left uh, $10 of quarters for the hotel arcade. They had the ability to order something to the room. So yeah, they were loving it, man. You know, they had a great evening. Watching uh, TV of the time, like Night Flight, you know. Sitting there watching Night Flight and eating ice cream sundaes. And your parents come home. And uh, you've never seen them this passionate, you know. And they're talking about this incredible discotheque. And uh, looking back on it now, I, I think I understand why... Uh, why this guy at this age was so damn impressed with this place, you know. His parents got him t-shirts for it. It's all metacognition. They, uh, they say, and, and by they, they, uh, I don't know, this guy I saw on YouTube. Um, but it made sense in my head, at least. Metacognition is uh, perhaps consciousness because at uh, any given uh, moment as we're thinking about something, if we're able to represent it separately from ourselves, for instance, I'm getting lots of stimuli in walking down the street with uh, Reese. And some of it I'm actively paying attention to. But at the same time, I'm remembering. And as such, I'm creating a, um, you know, an entity outside of myself. I, I'm, I'm calling to mind these ideas from memory and constructing. However, it could be that our mind in its uh, kind of fractal-like, perhaps using quantum technologies to uh, communicate in a way that we don't understand with uh, the other side or sides. That's very well could be the case. And also, because of this processing power, at any given moment, you could conceivably have a whole other set of memories. Will it explain why um, 1941 was not a big hit at the box office? No. Yeah, can't do that, brother. I just couldn't get excited about that one, you know. I, I tried to like it as a like underappreciated classic, and uh, I had it on VHS at a time when I thought my uh, fortune had far exceeded my uh, anything I deserved. I felt. As if I had won the art film lottery. A local video store was going out of business. And they had marked everything, uh, you know, ridiculously low prices. This was... Uh... Now, it's not, uh... it's not that bad of a deal, because this was 1992 or 3. You know, this wasn't, this wasn't too late. There was still another... Uh... 
I guess another five, six years of, uh, you know, VHS being something you could stand to use. You know, that's kind of the thing. It's not that you have anything against it or it's not like you hated it at the time. But to go back and use it now when uh, you're used to streaming, well, I, you know, it's just convenience, man. You, one you can do from the couch. The other, you got to go, you know, mess with stuff. But this physical stuff going away to the cloud is scary because with one keystroke, your access to all the art and memories that you've ever known could just be gone. Almost as easy as of a time as they would have of cutting off your... Uh, your bank or uh, stealing money out of your bank if you're Canadian this happened uh, just within the last year our place in the uh, in the galactic arm as we rotate us just a speck within that arm looking kind of like the arm but also rotating on its own plane all moving but relative to what you could pick a point and then measure from that point to one of the other points and you could call that a distance. The thing you'd have a harder time accounting for, currently at least, with great certainty, would be the expansion of the space itself between what you were measuring. reason to believe there could not be parts that were dilating as well. Now, when you look at it from the point of view that, uh, that time is only relative, you know, that's the wildest thing. That alone is the wildest thing in my mind of, uh, of all of it, because it's it's not just that clocks, a man-made created unit counting a man-made interval, it's not only that those stop moving through time from our perspective, but also living beings themselves. It's not just mechanical, it's everything goes to that different rate of transition or movement Vi you know, who, who knows exactly how you define that? But it's damn interesting. And being that it's all relative. Billion years, trillion years, zero years. It's all the same damn thing. If this is just a, uh, a choice you made to come along this adventure for however long your natural life should live, then you wouldn't worry much about it. Because you'd be gone for about as long as it took to make you comfortable in a place to sit while you experienced it. Maybe ten minutes. Maybe maybe uh, one minute. You know, maybe one second. So you, hey, I'm gonna go do one of those things again, and you go do it, and then you come back and you're at the same table with the same friends, just drinking coffee. And they're like, dude, you were gone for like almost a second. Sorry, I'm doing a little bit of podcast recording. Memory. He had a good time. Oh man, he just wandered around like usual. I just let him kind of go at his own pace. And I'm at work, and you know, as you do at work, I'm trying to go to archive to read old copies of sharper image catalogs or. Um, look at old magazines, you know, that sort of thing. Important things that must be done. And it's not there, you know. DDoS attack, last couple days, they had 30 million passwords stolen. You know, what a mess. Just can't take it for granted. It will always uh, be there. You know, I wish there were noise in public bathrooms. I don't like the silence, if you know. You know, even if you're just standing there trying to pee and the other person's, like, on the toilet doing whatever they're doing, you know. 
don't like the silence. It's too much silence. Too much uh, damn silence in here. The silence is too loud. I need Seaberg music system. Muzak from Kmart in the 70s. So. I need um, music Sears would play or uh, perhaps the grocery store. You know, classic Muzak pumped in would be so satisfying and comforting. As well as more ventilation. I think the, uh, the best thing for a publicly shared toilet space is good ventilation. I think an updraft where all the air is constantly you know, rising and moving out and being replaced by fresh air better than, say, an artificial cherry smell. Eh, now you got cherry flavored shit, you know, it's not really a good smell. Or, uh, or, or flowery smelling um, uh, bodily uh, excretion odors from things sitting on the floor for hours. Or the act of bacteria uh, you know, multiplying. And the idea that when you're smelling something it's actually you know little tiny molecules or physical particles of that thing actually being captured by these receptors in your nose so you know it's not just a smell it's the thing it's the thing itself it's particles of the thing itself that's the that's the thing about it have it uh, you know Brian May releasing these 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 wonderful compositions of noodling on the guitar, these uh, chromatic, spectrum-like, pleasing sounds that he just shoots off into the uh, into the world, you know, just right out of the right out of the air. It's a kind of magic. Freddie's command of the stage and uh, command of the performance and the crowd and the infectious uh, interactivity, the uh, I think he's inspiring them to sing along or call out or be a part of it. He's actually pulling them in, you know, it's a good front man skill to be able to uh, to capture an audience's attention in a way that pulls them into the uh, the emotions and song that you're putting out. You know, the performance has now become a, you know, a multiple person interaction. I used to have this one hair that would grow in the middle of my nose and I would uh, I would pluck it whenever it was long enough to pluck and it was really really thick and white on the bottom. It's a beautiful hair. It um, caused me to have frivols about starting a brush company where once every month or two I would collect this one precious um, unique nose hair and I would affix it to the end of a pin. And then I would sell it to this Chinese or Japanese guy that you know did some sort of artwork and he told the world that that my single nose hair brush was the finest instrument ever made for his artwork and we kind of became partnered up and you know all the uh, all the art rags and uh, entertainment books would talk about us and uh, and this partnership right this partnership my uh, my world-renowned nose hair brush or brushes and I actually did put some ink on the uh, the table once and using a, a pair of pliers I was uh, not pliers but uh, what do you call it the pluckers the, the, the ground pluckers that you pluck hair the tweezers was able to uh, to take that hair and manipulate some ink around so you know you got to think about that when I was a child, I was shopping in Gaffers, and um, 
I'd gone to the bathroom by myself. My mom knew where I was, but I went to the back and they had the offices where all the secretaries um, typed and, and the accountants would catch up uh, on the receipts from all the different departments of the Sears store. And there were ladies behind the counter at the catalog department and then off to one side there was the uh, layaway um, desk and if you went all the way down to the end there was a lady that would wrap items from you that was at the gift wrap counter you know all these people worked at the department store they were all good jobs not uh, not minimum wage jobs but decent jobs and this was you know how the world was before Amazon and uh, before the total takeover of um, you know profit driven corporate companies you know these were local entities owned by local people in the community that supported local baseball teams and uh, you know local charities and this was this was when uh, the United States still had a a culture the the people of the country had their own culture and while they appreciated every other culture in the world they did not appreciate their own culture and they let it die but that was probably not a good idea so I go into the bathroom and I'm, I'm approaching uh, one of the stalls and uh, I didn't use a urinal I don't think there were any in there from memory I just remember this place being white and, uh, and I'm standing there and you know you have to pee but uh, but all of a sudden you, you know you get there and you're right on the precipice of the pot and you're ready to go and it doesn't happen and I started imagining a um, an old stove like a, like a cast iron stove from an old Tom and Jerry or old Looney Tunes uh, type image and and it was building up pressure inside from the heat underneath and I was thinking about the fire growing in the heat and uh, and anyway I, that was about the time I started burning buildings down and uh, no no that was a that was an intrusive thought that wasn't real that was uh, oh that was when I peed so sometimes even now 45 50 years later I can sometimes still have this mental image of that same Looney Tunes uh, old Tom and Jerry uh, looking cast iron stove with the fire you know building up pressure and uh, yeah that's how you potty that's it tips you can use in your life from my life one eccentric habit I have is a uh, I eat donuts tractor tire donuts from Krispy Kreme these are called old-fashioned or crudlers a lot of times it's just so delicious I I like to eat them and I like it when other people refer to them as tractor tires I personally would rather not call them that but I do appreciate it when other people say it if I'm eating them or if I you know one out of the box they go oh you're going for the tractor tires because I, I feel like it's an attempt to uh, to be sociable and kind it's one of those um, it's one of those little statements somebody makes in an effort to uh, communicate in a friendly manner to another person you know just the act of the communication is the communication not so much important what is said yeah it's one of the angles it's one of the uh, it's one of the strange things because sometimes it's uh, it's not the text of what you said it's not the um, the literal meaning of the words in a row because that becomes an entirely separate thing Sometimes when I listen to Frank and he's saying the word right a lot, like like he'll say, well, the moon landing never happened right, and, uh, you know, the whole world's fake, right? You know, he says the word right a lot. I always say left. <laughs> it's kind of like when someone says, uh, what's the 
what's the general general yes sir you know what's the uh, what's the general uh, beverage around here general beverage yes sir you know saluting enthusiastic saluting there's a thing that Laura has pointed out to odd that I have always done in the car you know you have an armrest between the two seats and then you have often in a car you have two vents kind of in the center that you can arrange to blow back well I like to have them blowing right back through the center and I like to kind of prop my hand up and, and then my hand as if waving at the vent I like to just move my fingers around in that airflow and um, much like when you can't decide if you're hot or cold and you kick like a foot an unsocked foot out of from under the covers and and the radiator effect of your foot you know dispelling that heat from the blood flow puts you just in the zone of comfort and all of a sudden you can go to sleep it's like that it's like I, I'm I'm fingering the air I'm uh, I'm sort of air diddles you know moving my my hand around and the air is moving around it and taking a little bit of heat away and I can I can feel that transition of heat leaving my hands and it's quite nice and I suppose that's how it developed into a habit I have a, a paranoia about light switches. This possibility of going to uh, move the switch from the downward position to the up position, which in my preference would be the on and off, off and on positions, you know, off, down, on, up. But when you go to lift the switch, if it uh, were to get stuck in the middle, and it's even been possible to cause like kind of an electrical buzzing when doing this where you've uh, you know you're on your way to a short suck circuit there buddy I don't like that at all if you ever like go to go to flip a switch up and it kind of sticks somewhat in the middle it sends a little jolt of panic right in the center of my brain like a, like a little man in there riding on a hovercraft did, uh, did you know that Oscar Wilde, while studying at Oxford, had a pet lobster that he walked on a leash? I wonder if that involved a lot of picking up, carrying, and placing the lobster in other places. They don't seem like they would be good leash walkers. Do you remember when the uh, the internet brought us a, a few things that never went anywhere? One of them. One of them was short stories about uh, Roy Orbison wrapping himself in cling wrap. I remember when that was a thing. inspired me to do something similar with tinfoil but ended up being a um, a waste of good tinfoil or aluminum foil aluminum aluminum tin's actually quite expensive you ever play the game clue and right from the beginning you've got a, a sneaky suspicion that colonel mustard was the killer and uh, and he did it with a knife in the conservatory. It just seems like to me that he's probably the guilty party. I, it always has, and I think it's because he's um, called Colonel Mustard, and he's this mustard-colored uh, piece of plastic. And I just find the whole setup suspicious. In fact, the, the whole point of the game might be to, uh, to get us to cast our feelings about Colonel Mustard uh, 
aside out of the fear that it could be somebody else. You never know what's in that little envelope. But the thing about clues is that the uh, the word clue, you know, it comes from uh, the story of the Minotaur in Greek mythology. It's a man with the head of a bull and uh, Theseus trapped him in a labyrinth. And when Minotaur, uh, you know, put the king Theseus in a labyrinth, he uh, he escaped by using a barn, a ball of yarn, which is called a C L E W, a clue, and he used uh, the clue to track his path, so he could follow it again if he got lost and. Uh, he escaped, and it came to be used as a term that meant something that guides your path, and uh, and then later you know, something that helps you discover a truth. You know, having your fall, um, having your toe or your foot fall in a hole, you know, right before sleep, uh, dreaming of your teeth falling out, uh, dreaming of your wife and uh, your mother having a huge. Uh, epic world-ending battle as if they were two superheroes engaged in conflict spending time with the uh, great apes you know playing chess with a great ape or uh, building legos with a great ape i think that could be really enjoyable if you could get them to relax and you were comfortable in a room and he was watching you build something and then he started to build something and um, you know all of a sudden you're working on a car together that would be a pretty authentic experience that no one could take that away not even uh, Jose from Mexico talking about tacos you'd be more authentic than his tacos which were made from tongue and other meats that you don't even eat. You use salsa you'd never heard of, or, or crema, or these handmade tortillas that were just damn delicious. You better think. You better think about what you're doing to corn and all this corn oil you're making, all these seed oils. It's very disturbing. It's poison. You know, like successfully performing CPR on the guy that ends up uh, curing cancer you know just like a year later and uh, you inspired him by saving his life maybe he would have done it regardless uh, but not if he were dead and he said that you inspired him which made you feel good you know you got a, a mention in the book that would be thoroughly forgotten in less than a hundred years but nevertheless it was an authentic thing that uh, you felt proud of put it on your wall like a pennant like a pennant from a team that you once visited a felt pennant there sticking on the wall perhaps you had a few buttons you attached to it often these pennants that we would hang would end up being the home to these little buttons you didn't have a lot of money to buy an album, but if you went to the record store while you and your friends were walking around a mall on a Friday night trying to think what you could do with the $5, maybe $10 at most you had in your pocket, well, you know, besides getting some food at some point and a drink, a beverage, nice cold beverage uh, to enjoy yourselves with, at, like gentlemen, like, uh, like our good friend Ruben, Ruben Erd Shade down there in Australia. Congratulations uh, to him and Clara for their first home. I was very happy to hear that as well as uh, the story of how it all worked out. You know, your first choice ended up working out. That's a wonderful thing. Uh, hiking to the top of the mountain, looking, ar uh, looking around and realizing you can't remember why you came up there, you know. Um, having real friends or watching the sun rise after a, 
a mystical night where we started off vomiting and then later met God and um, learned that the uh, dreams were just an entertainment system for the uh, the prisoners, as Frank would say. Heck, take uh, smelling a rose, for instance. Take it to uh, the pawn shop and see if you can get anything to put in your pipe with that. Three people sniff a rose. Seven-year-old boy. Ah, oh, flower smells nice. Doesn't really care for it. Whatever. It's kind of a bland experience. A 20-year-old woman smells the rose. Her nose starts tingling, eyes water. She's got a pollen allergy experience is not pleasant at all and then the same thing a 70 year old man smells the rose and thinks of his mother and the roses she used to grow and he starts reflecting on these childhood memories and, you know it's all the same thing but uh, these interpretations right left <laughs>